Today's show is sponsored by Cloud Zero. For software-driven companies focused on growing margins, Cloud Zero is the only cloud cost intelligence platform that puts engineering in control by connecting technical decisions to business results. By analyzing cloud services like AWS and Snowflake, Cloud Zero provides real-time cost insights that help you maximize margins. Engineering teams can answer critical questions like, who are my most expensive customers? How much does this specific feature cost our business? What's the cost impact of re-architecting this application? With cost anomaly alerts via Slack, product-specific data views, and granular engineering context that makes it easy to investigate any cost, Cloud Zero is your complete cloud cost intelligence platform, connecting the dots between high-level trends and individual line items. Join companies like Drift, Rabbit7, and SeatGeek by visiting cloudzero.com slash cloudcast to get started today. That's cloudzero.com slash cloudcast. Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Hope everybody is doing well. This is the last show for June of 2021. We're flying through. It's Halfway through 2021, hard to believe that time's flying so fast, but uh, busy week uh, in cloud, in technology, lots of cloud news of the week, so let's get right to it. Uh, Confluent, a uh, friend of the show and uh, Cloudcast alum, uh, launched their IPO. They raised over $800 million, uh, nice uh, Nice opening week for them. I think they launched at around $36. I think they closed the day around $44. And as of now, which is uh, right here at the end of June, they're right around $50. So congratulations to the Confluent team. I know we recently had them on to talk about uh, Case SQL, about uh, sort of streaming databases. And uh, excited to see the Confluent team who uh, grew out of some technology, uh, Kafka, if you will, that uh, was originated over at LinkedIn. And they've been doing it for quite a while. So great to see uh, that finally hit IPO. And it'd be very exciting to see how well that team grows now that they're a public company and they sort of facing the rigors of uh, having to make quarter to quarter numbers. So congratulations to that team. Uh, next, Couchbase filed for their IPO for 2020. So uh, always, you know, looks like it's going to be a busy year for IPOs, for tech IPOs, and especially uh, for companies that uh, are founded and based on open source technology. So Couchbase Database, uh, one of the ones that's uh, very, very well suited for multi-cloud and hybrid cloud environments. So congratulations to them on uh, their filing, their S1 filing for the IPO. You can read about it uh, in the uh, in the Cloud News of the Week uh, notes. Uh also in money news, uh, Splunk announced a $1 billion investment from Silver Lake. Uh, so this was, uh, Splunk has been in the process, as, as many companies are, transitioning from being a, a very robust software company to becoming much more of a cloud delivery uh, company. So uh, for the last couple of years, um, Splunk has been uh, really transitioning more and more of their offerings to being sort of SaaS or, or cloud offerings. Uh, their recent uh, earnings numbers were up around, I want to say, just short of a billion dollars, about $800 million in cloud revenue for the quarter. So they're doing very, very well uh, in that case. And I think this investment uh, is an interesting one from Silver Lake. It uh, gives them quite a bit of capital, continue to expand out that business. Uh, it's convertible. Uh, so Silver Lake has the opportunity that if uh, the stock runs up because of this, uh, they have the opportunity to convert into stock, obviously profitable for them, but it gives... Um, Give Splunk some some leeway, some runway to continue to grow that business. And anytime you're growing the business from being software based, that whole go to market, sales, marketing, how you interact with your customers is very different than how you do it in the cloud. So you need some you need some flexibility in terms of how you transition your business model throughout that time. And uh, this will hopefully give Splunk uh, some flexibility to be able to to adapt to this new model. Uh, next was Oracle Cloud announced a new what they call points model for cloud buyers. So basically what this is is for customers that are buying uh, the Oracle Cloud infrastructure, their IaaS types of services, not so much their SaaS services or PaaS services, but their infrastructure services. Uh, essentially, um, for every dollar that you spend, um, you're going to get back somewhere between 25 and 33% in support costs. So it allows them to uh, you know, encourage customers to make longer-term commitments, uh, lower support costs, for longer term commitments, uh, lots of caveats. It's in the uh, it's in the show notes. You can take a look at it. But uh, starting to see Oracle trying to make some interesting um, interesting moves, interesting financial uh, engineering in terms of trying to 
uh, capture customers that you know are probably Oracle customers, but also potentially some new customers as well. So congratulations to them for trying to be creative. I think uh, you know we're definitely looking for some new creative thinking around how to consume cloud, how it costs, and how to best manage that. And then finally, we'll wrap up Cloud News of the Week with a big congratulations to a longtime friend of the show, uh, Alex Williams, his wife, Judy Williams, and the whole crew over at the New Stack. Uh, they were recently acquired by Insight Partners. Um, Alex is somebody who we've known for uh, as long as he's been running it. Uh, I think they've been doing it for now eight years now, so 2013, 2014. Um, Alex has been a friend uh, for a long, long time. He's somebody who's, um, you know, we've had on the show, we've been on his podcast. Um, and for anybody who uh, keeps up with the, the the information that's on the new stack, all the great articles and, and the team over there, Job and, and Ben Ball, who we've known for a long time, congratulations to all of them. I think this gives them uh, some much needed funding. Um, you know, they work their butts off. They are on the road. I mean, prior to COVID, they were on the road. They were at every event. They were doing pancake breakfasts. They're doing podcasts. They're cranking out news articles every single day, every week, and just a ton of really, really good insight. The news stack has been uh, a site that uh, we've read uh, religiously for years and years. Uh, the quality is really, really good. The breadth of conversation and technology they have is, is really, really good. So congratulations to uh, to Alex, to his wife, uh, the whole team over there. Uh, congratulations on this next milestone. And uh, like we said on Twitter, we, we hope that uh, this allows you to continue to crank out you know, great, great content in every form that you do it. Uh, you provide a great service to our community and we're uh, very honored to to know you and uh, you know uh, big congratulations to, to everybody over there so with that I'm going to wrap up uh, very excited about our next conversation we're going to have right after the break which we're really going to kind of dive into the intersection of a topic we've been starting to talk about low code but really kind of look at maybe a different view of this which is the intersection between low code and what uh, you know kind of in the weeds professional developers really need to dig into and and where do we draw the line where does it blur between you know seeing your code writing code and then having low code and how to having to manage between those two things. So we're going to get to that right after the break. Today's show is sponsored by Okta, the leading independent identity solution. Okta provides best-in-class authorization so your customers and workforce can safely access what they need most right when they need it from anywhere. Organizations around the world trust Okta's identity cloud to sign in, authorize, and manage users, whether it's employees, contractors, partners, or customers. And with Okta's developer tools, you'll never have to build authentication again. Our customizable code blocks are flexible and future-proof with easy-to-use APIs and SDKs, so you can do less coding and more shipping. Okta is dedicated to building the most reliable, neutral identity platform because it means protecting more than a login. Identity is protecting people, their ideas, their work, their brilliance. It's protecting your future with confidence. Learn more at Okta.com. That's O-K-T-A dot com. Today's show is brought to you by CBT Nuggets. You know how much we value ongoing education on the Cloudcast. And CBT Nuggets is exactly what Aaron and I wish we had when we were trying to get our certification early in our careers. CBT Nuggets is all about bringing a personalized touch to learning about cloud computing, virtualization, networking, DevOps, and much, much more. Whether it's their hands-on labs with personalized coaching or the online chat functions that come up with every instructor-led course, CBT Nuggets' team of experts is always there to help you get the most from your training and your PASA certification. You can check it all out at cbtnuggets.com cloudcast and sign up for a free trial. You get access to the full catalog of great training, including virtual labs, quizzes, and other premium features completely free for the first seven days. That's cbtnuggets.com slash cloudcast. And we're back. And folks, if you've been paying attention, as I know many of you have uh, very recently, you know, one of the topics that we've been trying to explore more and more, and it's a topic that's fairly diverse in terms of, of implementations and, and uh, options that are in the marketplace, um, is this idea of, of both sort of low code and no code and, and how it impacts both, uh, you know, companies that may not make huge investments in their developers, as well as kind of the other end of the spectrum um, in terms of, you know, companies that, that have investments in developers, but also want to somehow make it simpler for them, make it easier for them to uh, move quickly, especially for a broad range of tasks. And so today we're very, very excited to keep exploring that topic, keep looking at uh, you know, different ways that, that companies can take advantage of, of both low-code and no-code. Um, so very excited to have Sanjeeva Viravarna, who is CEO of uh, WSO2. Sanjeeva, welcome to the show. Great to have you with us today. Thank you, Brian. Very nice to be here. 
So I, I want to dive into uh, you know all the work that that you've been doing around this. But before we dive into that, let's talk a little bit about your background. You've got a, a very very rich background in terms of really being an inventor, um, you know, being at the forefront of of creating uh, the technologies and and sort of the thought leadership around how developers have been productive. Give us a little bit of your background. Help folks understand a little bit about kind of the the things you've been doing for for years and years, even prior to, to WSO two. So let me let me start with a little bit of my experience from university because I think that's where it all started for me. I spent nine years in university, the last five years doing a PhD, and then I taught at Purdue University uh, for a few years and joined IBM Research. And I finished my PhD about the time the web was taking off um, for consumer use. It was 1994, and there were lots of application platforms we developed, and web as a, a platform for building applications was really taking off. Then when I joined IBM, I worked a lot on technology for making it easier to build certain kinds of interactive applications. Then got involved with the web, the web services technology, starting with XML, almost right after I joined IBM. And they became part of the IBM team that defined, along with a bunch of people from Microsoft, many of the things that would later become uh, core standards of the, the web services platform the first version of the web services platform. Right. And that being sort of XML and SOAP and WSDL and so on. And uh, that that gave me, and went along with that to work on various other protocols like the, the web service business process language and, and so on. And did a bunch of open source work around that and really enjoyed creating technology for developers to build applications with. Yeah, and no, that's- sort of been my theme. Yeah, no, and 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 uh, we're going to dive into more and more of that because the work that you continue to do is, uh, you know, again, it, very much around those big themes of uh, standards for the web, uh, open source, being able to make developers productive, and excited to dive into that. Um, I, I want to kind of get started. You know, we're we're at a stage where every business opportunity that comes along, you know, tends to require new applications. Nobody just sort of says. Hey, I'd like to make the you know the red on the website redder. It's it's hey, if we had a new application, if we had a new way to engage with our customers, um, and and the interactions that these applications have to have are with multiple systems. We no longer sort of build sort of standalone applications. I, I want to talk about a little bit about your philosophy. You're you're just recently now launching uh, the um, the Corio iPass platform. So your path platform to really help um, not only further integration but also further developer productivity. Can, can you talk a little bit about kind of the, the mindset that you have, the thought process you have about, you know, the core elements that are, that are part of this platform? Absolutely. So I think, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said everybody wants to create something new and, and that's the only way to move forward. And so what, what we see is uh, the old adage of uh, build or buy has become build or die. So you have to create your own digital experiences and deliver that to your customers in a way that is innovative, modern, and in, in the form that the customers want to see. So that means you have to be able to build things. And, and as you said, building things involve taking uh, other services and, and essentially decomposing yourself as much as possible and putting it back together to create something new. And that's fundamentally the driving point of the Corio iPass. But really what's underneath the Corio iPass is a new programming language called Ballerina Yep. that we have been working on for five years. And that's what the fundamentals of that are what we are ex exposing through Corio as a, a different kind of iPass. Yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about Ballerina for, for those that uh, maybe aren't as familiar with it as, uh, as obviously you are. Give us some of the core tenets of, of you know, why you decided to create a new language and, and what are some of the, the really powerful things that it exposes for, for developers? Yeah, so we we started working on Ballerina. Um, uh, we had we had a focus team working on Ballerina starting five years ago. But we started thinking about how do you radically innovate on how you create integration applications, which is the way we were thinking about it at the time. We had shipped an ESB product in 2005, 2007 timeframe, and you know, and had evolved it. And and you know, all all the vendors in the industry have some kind of a integration technology around data flow, right. primarily. And what we found was there was a limit to how much you could push that DSL approach, data flow approach to, to making integration simpler. 
in the end, we concluded the only way to make that better is really by addressing the fundamental problems by changing the abstraction layer of how you think about it, thereby creating a programming language. And fundamentally, there are a few key things in Valerina that distinguish it from uh, other modern languages. And they're really around the fact that producing and consuming services are essentially what modern programming is often about. And second, when you produce and consume services, you are always dealing with data. You're not dealing with objects, you're dealing with data. Your right. objects can't go over the wire, you only deal with data. And most modern languages that are dealing with this problem don't support data as a first-class concept, don't support service consumption and service production as a first-class concept. And then we also wanted to have a very a, a novel concurrency model and a way of representing programs graphically. Because graphical representation, when you talk about applications that need to be shown in front of business users to say, this is what we are going to do, you need a picture. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Right. And we came up with a model for the, where the program written in the source code has a, has a graphical representation and the graphical representation is the code, not just a picture. So you can edit either one and you're changing the code. Yeah, and that, and that was one of the things that really jumped out at me as I was <clears throat> as I was kind of digging into it was was this idea that um, you know in some cases uh, you know I mentioned that the at the top of the show um, you know as we explore low code or, or no code depending on how people want to classify it um, you know on on one end people go well it's it's just really simple stuff it's essentially you know an Excel spreadsheet or or something a little more advanced than that. But then you get into the situation of, you know, what do I do when, I, when I'm building more advanced applications or I need to sort of dive into the code? Um, you know, you don't necessarily want it to be a black box. Um, and that's what really jumped out at me around Corio was this idea that, you know, it's, it's this mirror, kind of mirror representation of what's visual for those that need it to be visual and, and that can simplify it for them. But you don't really ever give up the ability to then see and, and interact with the code piece of it. And that, that seems incredibly powerful and, and, and very sort of new and novel in the market. Absolutely correct, Brian. Uh, the, the, the ability to have a smooth transition from a low code view of a program to a source code view so that you can essentially build the code the way you want, whether you want to draw it in a graphical low code kind of experience or switch tabs and go edit the source code and share it back, commit it back into GitHub, pick it up and edit it somewhere else. And it's this continuous process. It is not a DSL approach to the problem where you have a limited capability in the, in the form of low code. I mean, you want to go beyond that, you need to lift up the hood and dive in. In Korea, you don't, you never have that transition. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that seems really powerful, right? We get into these kind of opinionated platforms and, and developers they get excited about the first part of it, and they run into, you know, a, a corner case or, or an unusual use case. I, I'm curious, you know, the, the platform has now been, uh, you know, out in use uh, to a certain extent, beta and, and other things. You've had people uh, using it in anger to a certain extent. What are some of the, the use cases? What are some of the patterns that you've seen emerge for, for usage, for things that people have given you feedback on uh, around, you know, both the applications they're building, but also... Uh, that interaction of, of graphical and code uh, being being side by side? So I, I would say, first of all, that it is still very early days. Sure. So we're still learning along with our customers as to what uh, users and customers, I should say, along uh, as to what is more important, what the most um, sort of the most uh, differentiating and productive factor. But what we are seeing is the the idea of being able to create something and create something and get it into a production environment very rapidly and then make that something shared that other people can build on is, is a key thing that people love. Uh, you know, what, what Corio represents in many ways, what we have learned by providing technology to customers, integration technology to customers for 15 years. And what we have learned is that many people who buy this stuff spend a lot of time creating an architecture and process and culture for reusable uh, services, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, the holy grail of software engineering for many, many years has been reused. Right. And the API economy and the service architecture and Docker and Kubernetes, all of these now facilitate a degree of reuse that was simply unthinkable. Yet the 
the programming of them has not been as smooth as we think we are going to make it. And that's what we are seeing people getting really excited about. And the low code and the code aspect uh, simply just uh, reduces that barrier. You know, a professional developer often scoffs at low code. Sure. Saying, well, you know, uh, I'm not going to draw pictures, right? I, I'm a serious programmer. I need my, my VS code. Yep. And Courier, you can do that. And you don't lose anything. You, and you're not, you know, you get the productivity of low code if you want it. And you get the ability to share with others and get all the, all the visual benefit. But you're still editing source code. And right. you get concurrency, you get network interactions, all of that very graphically and visually represented. And, and without you know, ever leaving your VS Code uh, editor plugin, if that's what you wish to do. Right. Yeah, and that's, that always feels like uh, the, you know, one of those sort of barriers of entry is, I don't want to give up the tools that I'm very used to. I, I've, I've built some workflows around that. But um, it, yeah, and that's, and that's an incredibly powerful, powerful construct. I'm curious, you know, as, as I'm thinking about, um, you know, you, you know, we talked about sort of the, the professional developer, but also this idea of reuse. Um, do you begin to see some new interactions happening? You know, it, it's, it's not unusual for, uh, you know, a line of business, uh, you know, somebody with an idea who's not necessarily a programmer to go, hey, I wish, I wish we could do X, Y, and Z. I wish we had an application that did, uh, you know, these things. And in their mind, you know, they, they can kind of visualize it. Maybe they can, they can draw it on a napkin. They can draw it on a whiteboard or PowerPoint or something. Do you find that, that now this, this sort of, you know, dual interaction between uh, the developer can go write code, but are they starting to bring the, the business user into the picture so they can say, hey, let, let me show you what this looks like? Because they could never understand if you showed them a bunch of uh, ballerina code or Java code. It just looks like a bunch of lines on a screen. But if you can show them it visually, I feel like that may... Uh, speed up the interactive interactive nature between teams or the the iterative you know like hey okay I see where you're going let's let's tweak that a little bit are, are you beginning to see some new kind of organizational dynamics or organizational interaction because you're now exposing sort of both sides uh, at the same time um I, I would say we are but it's still very early days yeah there, there are there are a, the, the ability to reflect and sort of uh, uh, you know, understand and perceive what this system is doing, uh, you know, pictures with a thousand words, right? So just yeah. being able to show a business user a picture that abstracts your complicated program just to the interactions between the different components is massively powerful. Right? Yeah. And, and that that is something that we are delivering through this architecture. And uh, we are beginning to see how that's uh, kicking up a significant uh, benefit, but it's still, again, we're in early days, so we are learning along with our users. Like, wh what are the right ways of presenting that? What are the right ways of tweaking that experience? And, and that's something that we are still, I would say, iterating on to get it as fine-tuned as possible. Sure. And and do you find the, the business users, and the, the sort of, you know, what you might call a non-professional developer, are starting to, to interact with the system a little more directly? Uh, you know, are they sort of you know, starting to learn through the, the visual, maybe they go over and look at the code, maybe start to make some uh, understanding between them and, and they're, they're developing as well. Do you see the development happen uh, as well on the business user side? Um, you know, it just in this process, uh, or are you seeing, you know, sort of inklings of that beginning to happen? Um, I, I, w I would give an optimistic yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, a, this is a tough transition, right? This business IT gap, I, I used to teach software engineering many, many years ago. And, and, you know, this is things that we've talked about for decades, the gap between what business wants and what IT can deliver. Um, and these are, and, you know, business process uh, uh, tools were supposed to address that problem. And they do to some extent. The workflow tools that exist are quite good. But we are now taking it beyond the narrow domain of workflow to saying, why is it limited to workflow? It's every application. Right. Right. Everything you write, every digital capability I put out, the business has to be part of it. And APIs are digital capabilities. And, and when I create a new capability or when I decide I'm going to depend my, reorganize my business so that I depend on this third party capability, I need to see how that, how that interacts with my rest of the business. So all of that is being slowly but surely visualized through this, this kind of approaches. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, we, we spent a little bit of time today talking about, 
you know, kind of this this interaction uh, or, you know, the, this this way of writing code that becomes visual. And, and I think, you know, the other piece that, that really intrigued me was, um, you know, it's, it's like you said, this isn't just, uh, you know, business pl- business process workflows. This is also, you know, an, an integration platform. And, and as many business ideas that come along, you know, hey, I know what we can do within our business. We want to do X, Y, and Z in this, these steps, and we want to be able to automate them. But in many cases, you want to talk to external systems. You want to talk to, uh, you know, applications, data sets that are on the web. You want to interact with, with applications that people use on a regular basis. That seems to be equally as powerful um, in terms of it's not just the, the low code piece of it, but it's also the integration piece so that you don't sort of stop uh, and say, oh, well, these applications can only do workflow or they can only do sort of simplistic things. Look, they have this full range of, of you know, kind of external integrations that we can integrate with. I, that feels like a really, really powerful concept of the platform as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the, 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 the fact that you are bringing into the low code experience Essentially, the full gamut of programming right. uh, is really an important, uh, I would say, a, a, a sort of a next step in programmer productivity in some sense. Uh, in the sense that, you know, when, when IDEs came out, so I, I predate IDEs. I started with VI and Emacs. Yeah. Right? Uh, and in that era, you know, we had, we dealt with obviously lots of complicated software, but the the build tools, the CI, CD concepts, none of those existed. We relied on right. people to take care of all these problems, right? Then IDEs came about and CI, CD came about and, and the software stack became more and more complicated. And the ID and, and you know, VS Code in particular and, and you know, some of the tools from various other uh, uh, vendors are really, really powerful at uh, reducing the complexity for the programmers so they can focus on the development part and everything else is taken care of for them. Uh, I kind of see what what languages that bring graphical visual representation of source code as another step in that productivity improvement we can do for developers. Yeah, because you can step up from you know hundreds of files and directories and modules and APIs and all that and talk about a sequence diagram that represents the program, what it does, how it flows and dig into whatever level of detail that you want or zoom out and kind of see, oh, this is what this thing is doing. Yeah, no, and, and that's and that's an incredibly important concept. And it's it's useful that you've got the historical context of it. I, I think every time we've seen a big jump uh, in, in sort of the computing landscape, if you will, it's always around how do we bring more people into the into the ability to to interact with these systems to program these systems, you know we've seen this on the web. You know we went from uh, you, you know very text centric things to you know tools that would visualize things for us. We could drop and drag stuff. Um, you know we saw that on you know mobile as the devices became more more graphical, more simpler to use. This feels like another kind of big step in terms of you know ultimately you know like we mentioned at the top of the hour um, you know every one of these business ideas becomes something that needs an application, needs an integration. And, and if you're only relying on professional developers, which is a finite group and sometimes an expensive group, um, you're limiting yourself. And, and so this feels like another big step in being able to say, you know, these problems that we face as a business can't just be only the developer's problems to solve. These need to be things that we can incorporate business analysts and, and other parts of the uh, parts of the business to become you know, relevant to bring their skill set um, to this space where you can you can simplify code, but you can also do really powerful things. I, I think you're exactly right. The, the, the idea that in an enterprise um, that you can leave the the problem of creating new business capabilities just to one small part of the business, uh, you know, is kind of silly, right? That that is, and and when when all new capabilities in the enterprise that you create, any enterprise, what kind of business it is, have some digital component today. Nothing is without software. Right. Everything has some software in it. And to say, well, you know, we have a, a you know, software house within the company or outsourced or whatever, and they will do all that for me. I just have to write them a spec. Um, completely loses the fact that nothing in the modern world gets written with a long spec and then implemented and then deployed. Right. right? 
everything is iterative everything is agile you know fail fast yeah get it deployed quickly uh, deploy every day all these principles require that you have a much more productive cycle and that's another thing that we address in corio that it's not just about the development process it's about development it's about automated testing it's about deployment it's about observability it's about scaling and being able to iterate back and forth at every one of those stages yeah no and and that's again that's sort of like you said it 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 builds on this idea of you're not just uh you know buying things anymore you're really kind of trying to to build and buy outcomes uh if you will i, I want to talk about one last piece of this and before we we let you go i know you're you're very very busy um you know, as I looked at the platform, there's there's quite a bit of the ability to to give uh, developers, users of the system, not only self service, um, you know, give them guardrails, but let them go off and, and do things within a self service uh, kind of marketplace framework, but also a lot of what feels like AI or or intelligence to help guide them down the right path. Right? How, how much do you think about um, you know being able to say, hey, look, the goal of this isn't necessarily just to write great applications, but the goal of this is to to make you productive. And, and part of the ways to make you productive is to give you tips, to give you, uh, you know, kind of intelligent feedback as you're going along. Is that a conscious thing that you've been doing, you know, really, again, around this whole idea that the goal is productivity, the goal is, um, you know, iterative feedback, um, that, that feels like something really kind of core um, principle to the platform, if you will. Yes. Uh, uh, from the time we started this project, we always uh, knew that intelligence or AI or machine learning uh, has to be an integral part of the entire process. So we designed an instrumentation architecture, we designed the data analytics architecture, we designed a, a whole ML pipeline so that we could capture information and also be able to gather experience from entire gamut of users of the platform and deliver it in a focused way to every user. So yes, absolutely. Intelligence, uh, a, a, you know, of course, even even compilers, uh, IDEs, they all have some level of intelligence that help you sure. avoid mistakes and and, and so forth. Right. <clears throat> uh, the advantage of being a cloud platform, where we are dealing with uh, lots of different people doing lots of different interactions, is we can predict since we see how other people's code is doing, we we, we can know a priori what's going to happen when this program runs and give you a hint saying, hey, this program's going to be doing, you know, I can only handle 75 TPS the way you've written it, right? And, and that's fine. You just have to scale it up more if you want to scale it up more and so on. So there's a lot of developer uh, improvement that we believe we can give with AI being deeply married at every stage of that process of creating new digital innovations. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, in, in today's world with, with things moving quickly, people having demands on, you know, results, uh, you know, faster and faster, weekly, daily, quarterly. Um, that seems incredibly important. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you one last thing before we go. What's, uh, you know, it's it, it's great to talk about these technologies. What's the best way for for developers, uh, for, for people that are trying to sort of improve business process or, or how they integrate? What's the best way to, to get started with the, the Corio platform? What are the, what are the different ways that people can engage, whether it's, you know, simply, you know, trials, but also engage with the platform and engage with your team? Yeah, so uh, absolutely. The, the, the best way is, you know, try it out, right? Sure. Uh, there's nothing in software like <laughs> something that works. Uh, and and, and we, 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 we want to hear from you because we want to learn from your experience. We want to understand where you got stuck, if you got stuck, where, where you felt challenged and all of that. And uh, really, you know, come to wc.com slash Corio and, and experience it and give us feedback. We, we plan to have a permanent free developer tier. One of our goals is for Corio to be something that hobby programmers use for their own personal use. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, getting getting a service up or a web hook up on the internet. Uh, of course, you get a, you know all kinds of developer tiers from all the the platform vendors, uh, from whether it's Microsoft or Google or AWS or whatever. Uh, but there is a um, this this is a much more focused platform that just lets you focus on that part of the problem and just get it up and running just within a few minutes. So we we are very keen to get developer feedback. We want to see monitor their experience really understand how they can be productive 
and that's at the developer level then at a, at a cio level this is a this is really about increasing the the the, the productivity of your of your IT offering internal team and ability to create new digital innovations very very fast. So very happy to talk to uh, you know people about that and explain how they can uh, take advantage of that. Yeah, no, that's that's outstanding. I, I think you know the the commitment to having you know, you know free cheers forever and, and and allowing people to use it. You know, obviously not only for work but also for for personal projects is is outstanding. It's uh, you know it shows not only a commitment to you know people learning and experimenting on the platform, but just understanding that there's really a broad set of, of use cases that people may want to take advantage of this technology from from small to, to very, very large. So Sanjeeva, I want to thank you so much today. Uh, it's 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 fun to sort of dive into not only, you know, kind of new ways that, that companies are are allowing uh, you know developers to to interact with with their applications, but also business, but also really seeing um, you know, a lot of of uh, system thinking come together over a number of years. So it's exciting to see where the Corio platform's going. Um, with that, folks, I'm going to wrap up. Again, we want to thank Sanjeeva for his time today. Uh, we're going to wrap up. Thank you all for listening to the show. Thank you for constantly giving us feedback and helping us grow the community and uh, obviously giving us feedback uh, through Apple Podcasts and other places where you listen to the show. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, I'm going to, for myself and for Aaron, we want to thank Sanjeeva again, and we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media.